I think we need to get better at storytelling. And, and part of it is we need to be better pulling accurate versions of history, not just the tweet length versions of history. Hi, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and this is The Money Movement. We're here in Paris, France. This week is Paris Blockchain Week and Circle Forum Paris, and I'm very pleased to be welcoming here founder and CEO of Masari, Ryan Selkis. Welcome, Ryan. It's good to be here. Great backdrop. It's been 10 years, I think, since we first met, so yes. time flies. It has been, yeah. So I actually, uh, I want to, you know, for, for, uh, for everyone, we have a very long history as well that goes back 10 years. Um, and Circle uh, is celebrating its 10th anniversary mm -hmm. as well. Um, but m maybe just, it's always fun in, in these conversations, situate yourself 10 years ago. I think you dropped out of an MBA to go all in on, on, on crypto in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but like, let's just talk about kind of what, what emerged for you then and kind of what yeah. brought you into all this. Well, I got really lucky because I started my career in venture capital, which is also an accident because I was supposed to work at JP Morgan and that was the summer of 2008 when I was supposed to start and I got rugged at the last minute by JP Morgan um, and ended up skipping a grade and, and got right into venture capital because I had a couple friends working at a firm in Boston. Um, did that for a few years and then I started uh, a company focused on the payment space, uh, the charitable um, space. We actually created something similar to Fidelity Charitable, but mm. combine it with, uh, with payroll giving. Long story short, took the IRS two years to get us our exempt status. So we won a couple of business plan competitions, but I was winding down the company around the same time that I was supposed to start business school. Um, and uh, there was about a two month uh, miss there. Uh, so I wound the business down in October. I think I met you right around that yeah. same time. And then I had 10 months on my hand with nothing to do. So um, not enough time to get a job. I knew that I had the deferred offer if I wanted to go to business school, you know, kind of that next year. And that was right when Bitcoin, yeah. you know, first started. I mean, it's not, first, not the first, it's first cycle, but uh, maybe uh, the first mainstream consciousness cycle. Exactly. The thousand, the thousand dollar run that, yes. that fall. And um, just went down the rabbit hole, said, I'm going to make a good run at this the next year. And by month four or five, I just thought I'll kick myself if I don't see this through. Uh, just based on all the folks that I'd met because it was still so early and, and just you know, kind of seeing, seeing the potential. Uh, firsthand, uh, and uh, you know, here, here we are, ten years later. Totally, yeah. And you've, uh, you've, you've chronicled it. Uh, you've, you've been a, uh, <clears throat> uh, an entrepreneur, and and helping to facilitate uh, a huge array of different like projects in the ecosystem. You're uh, a, pr a proper, uh, 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 you know, I, I think um, ambassador and agitator in the policy circles. We're going to come back to a lot of that, but. You know, Dante's the ambassador. I'm the agitator. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I would agree. Uh, um, you, know, you know, there's f uh, some fun history. I, I uh, now and then I I share with people uh, uh, one of the art articles that you wrote, which was a kind of mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it an investigative piece, but it was like a a, a really early piece about Circle, mm -hmm. and um, I think it was it was published. Um, Either in December 2013 or January 2014, and um, and and you had sort of been you know hearing various rumors about what we're doing. We sort of kind of quietly debuted the company, um, but maybe if you could share, what do you remember about hearing about what we were trying to do back then? Again, it goes back to everything being an accident, right? Uh, I just knew that there was a company in Boston that was getting off the ground that was you know the first credible uh, mm -hmm. other large company that had raised significant money next to Coinbase, and I lived in Boston. And I was yeah. like, I gotta figure out more about this company because yes. I'm, I just found down you know, an operation, maybe I could you know, do something with them or, or yeah. at least you know, kind of get connected around. Um, so uh, I'd actually met one of your investors from General Catalyst for lunch yeah. uh, while I was figuring out what I wanted to do. And, and, uh, and, and you know, between that and piecing some other things together, uh, just knowing where the gaps were in the market at that time, um, was, uh, was, was really interested, especially given, you know, you're in Sean's background. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, that discovery mode, um, was really prompted by, um, I don't know if I've told this story, but 
but basically the day that I shut uh, my, my first startup down, I ended up um, you know, feeling sorry for myself, and then the next day I had these passes through the accelerator that were into HubSpot's content marketing, mm -hmm. like um, you know, huge extra sure. extravaganza in Boston. Right. Um, and one of the sessions that I went to, um, this woman basically gave a 30 day challenge to everyone that was in the seminar, just like write every day about something for a month. And I was like, oh, well, I, I just bought this Bitcoin thing and it just doubled, so maybe I should figure it out and I'll write about it. And um, I went through all of Coinbase's, you know, blogs and, and basically like their customer service 101 almost uh, for, for some source material, figuring out what you guys were working on, combing. At that point, I remember it was just Reddit. Mm -hmm. Our Bitcoin was kind of the, the, the source yeah. of truth and information. Um, and, um, and so I put together just kind of daily summaries uh, mm -hmm. and, and this newsletter, you know, persists today in, in a different form, totally. you know, being the backbone of Masari's, yeah. uh, or at least how we seeded that, that list. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, write, writing, you know, ended up being a, a good entree uh, and, and, and good wedge for someone that was not a developer at the time yeah. when no non-developers were getting hired for roles unless they, you know, started a company. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but. Oh, it's amazing. Um, you know, a, 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 as someone who has, in fact, kind of chronicled all of the ups and downs and permutations, et cetera, I, I think you have the benefit of looking back 10 years and remembering like what it was then you know, very vividly and now thinking about kind of what it is now. You know, it, it's, it's very easy to kind of say, oh, we're in this you know, crypto winter and there's you know, all this like regulatory pressure and you know, uh, you know, w in the U.S. and other places, all, all this sort of complexity, and mm -hmm. um, but this industry obviously has faced massive adversity, you know, forever, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as as you think about you know where we are today, just may maybe just kind of reflect on on you know how far we've come, um, and and you catalog it literally, yeah. uh, and so. Uh, so I think you have one of the best bird's eye views uh, out there when, when we think about you know, what, what's been accomplished. I think each bear market is scarier than the one before it for many different, for, for vastly different reasons. So in 2015, when we were coming off the 2013 highs, there was that prolonged period of time where you started seeing companies just die. And not in the context of startup land, but in the context of like an entire industry and different pieces of the infrastructure falling down because they were running out of money. Um, and it was, I think, touch and go in 2015, um, especially not even necessarily during the low point, but during those summer months where things were just oscillating yeah. around 200 and, totally. and you, you, and especially, you know, at, at the time I was at Digital Currency Group, so we had invested in so many of these companies. Yeah. We knew what the burn rates were. Yeah. We knew, you know, that, that it was an ice cold market for, for founders. And it wasn't really clear whether things were going to fizzle uh, yeah. at that point or, or whether right. there would it's be some staying power. Pretty pessimistic, yeah. Um, but it still felt lower stakes because yeah. it was year six of the experiment, right? So if it, if it didn't pan out, like everybody would have been able to kind of March right. their separate uh, ways, go go their uh, you know into their corners, and then you know iterate on something new, or or, or basically go back to the well. Um, in in 2018, it felt pessimistic for non-payments um, use cases, right? So like after the crash of the ICOs, all right, we got way too far ahead of ourselves. Are these tokens really ever going to be anything? Are they all quasi you know equities? Are they you know this whole concept of utility tokens was that just a right. flash in the pan and, and right. kind of regulatory arbitrage game? Um, so as an asset class, I'd say it was very scary in 2018, and maybe mm -hmm. you know more scary in 2018 for for those that were in Ethereum. This one though, absolutely feels like it's the scariest um, because. We are, I think, at the final boss phase <laughs> of this market and its yeah. development, and it's going to piss a lot of very powerful people off. Uh, and in fact, it already has. So um, I think crossing this chasm and getting the industry to a spot where it is actually going to be you know, well regulated and, mm -hmm. and safely integrated into the financial system, and that some of these emerging projects are going to have the opportunity yeah. um, to hit the growth phase uh, in, in their evolution. Um, I think it's a really important year or two that we have coming totally. up. And we have just about every headwind that you can imagine right now, you know, staring us in the face between the macro situation and just being in a, a secular recession. 
um, between all of the damage that we had um, layering on a macro recession, a, a, a come down from the bull market highs, and right. the unwinding of, of you know, the crypto credit bubble, um, which was really the first credit cycle yeah. overlaid on crypto. Yeah. Um, not to mention all of these regulatory headwinds now yeah. um, and, and some of the things that are happening in the banking Just sector. Enormous so. number of, of, of bankruptcies and company failures and fraud and <laughs> it's pretty, pretty brutal. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think Final Boss uh, kind of I- interesting and, you know, the Jeff, famously Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm yeah. Kind, yeah. Of, kind of thing. And like there's a big chasm here. But it, it's yeah. a, I think it's also an opportunity for people to step up. Right. So um, I'm sure like you, you know, doing different dinners at, at different folks uh, at different points with folks that we've known for a long time. And, mm-hmm. and you look around the table and it feels like <laughs> feels like they're a lot smaller than they were like a year, year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that's alarming if you just look at some of the, the legacy folks that have been knocked off their pedestal, you know, yeah. some in spectacular fashion. But it's also, I think, an opportunity for other people to rise, step up, yeah. and for, you know, uh, the wheat to get separated from the chaff here. Yeah, w- w- without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, I, I think um, we think a lot about this, you know, how do we move from speculative value phase to utility value phase and and obviously you know usdc itself and the kind of core vision for circle has always been like you know kind of real world utility Mm vis-a-vis kind of this new base layer for money on the internet and programmable money on the internet and what can you do with that how does that impact finance and commerce and all this other stuff um but um but but it it feels like um you know a a lot of other people are, are are converging on you know, on that thesis, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, you you, you guys track the, you know, the the sort of all the relevant ecosystems really, mm-hmm. really closely. And I don't know if you were at ETH Denver or, or not, but I mean, an extraordinary amount of of technical innovation that's happening in in that ecosystem. Layer twos, layer ones, account abstractions, so so many so many things that are happening. As a technologist, when mm-hmm. I look at this, um, I'm like way, I'm like more bullish than I've ever been, like yeah. in terms of what is actually being built and what we're going to be able to do, um, which, which is great. Um, so we, we kind of I believe are on the cusp of you know kind of crossing the chasm from a technology and usability perspective, mm-hmm. um, and and that's that's going to happen I think over the next year. The really pivotal question, which I know you have a lot to to say about, is are we going to cross the chasm in terms of sensible regulation? Uh, and, and we can talk about the U.S., we can talk about the rest of the world, we can talk about the dynamics there. But you know, wh- wh- what are the odds that we're going to land something so that the core innovations of, of, of DeFi and of, of, of DAOs and, and, and token mechanics and uh, the, the, the broader kind of market infrastructure, like that, that that's going to come across the other side so that Major companies can be built and major communities can thrive. What, what's your outlook on that? I think it's going to be very, it's going to vary widely by region. Um, and to your point about ETH Denver, these technologies are not going to be uninvented. Yeah. Right? And, and, and different regions are at different phases of, uh, of incorporating crypto or Web3, whatever you want to call it. I still say crypto. I think Web3 is dead to me. But anyway, <laughs> um, we, we tried our Web3 marketing moment, and it, we fell on our face with it. So we're back to crypto. Um, but uh, I think the, the folks that are, are taking a serious look at, at crypto policy, you think about what's happening with Mika here in the EU. Um, you think about uh, how far ahead Singapore, Korea, Japan are right now in terms of grappling with this and, and integrating you know, crypto and, and some of those infrastructure companies into their financial services regimes. Mm -hmm. Um, The US really is on an island where the ambiguity in some respects I think has helped because there's been a lot of experimentation and there's almost too many. Uh, There's, uh, you know, I made the comparison, you know, my my six-year-old was wondering why, you know, I was so upset uh, last week. (laughs) And you know, I, I had to compose myself because you know it bothers the kids when when like dad's upset, of course. 
Um, and I said, well, because we just watched um, the bu A Bug's Life the weekend before. Yeah. And I was like, you know, you know that scene where Flick is, is like, he finally realizes there's like 100 times as many ants as grasshoppers? Like, <laughs> that's kind of like me and my friends right now. We're all really frustrated, but like, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, about to, you know, have this like big battle with the grasshoppers. And he thought that was really cool. Um, and it does feel like that. It, sh it shouldn't, but it does. Mm. Um, and part of it is because... Um, this is complicated, it evolves quickly, and from a, regulatory, a regulator's perspective, it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole, and you see the headlines, and you, see, you have the pressure kind of top down in many cases yeah. to do something, yeah. especially in the wake of, of uh, just a bunch of errors, unforced errors like we had last year between mm -hmm. Three Arrows, and then Luna, and then FTX, of course. Yeah. And, um, and I think the natural tendency is to, you know, frankly, be um, cut corners and just be as fast uh, and unthorough, per perhaps, as possible to solve a broader systemic issue or threat mm -hmm. that you view, uh, instead of being a little bit more thoughtful. Because we do have some policymakers that that I think, you know, are trying to take the long view yeah. and be a little bit more uh, careful than um, than currently what we're facing in the U.S. So, you know, I I, I think. The variance is wide. Uh, the spoils will go to the more patient jurisdictions um, and, uh, and to the countries that are actually going to you know, support innovation and, and view this as an opportunity versus mm -hmm. just a, a nail that needs to be hammered. Yeah. I, I want to come back to the, the, the sort of glo global, regional d dimension on all of this, <clears throat> but I, I know you're, you're very dialed in on the U.S. Uh, uh, political and regulatory environment, and uh, we, one only needs to read your Twitter account uh, to uh, to get a flavor for that. Um, but you know, I, I, like, do you believe that bipartisan policymakers are going to get their arms wrapped around, let's just say, stablecoin <clears throat> legislation, which is sort of the lowest hanging fruit and obviously is, is actually somewhat urgently needed, mm -hmm. just this base layer that so much other stuff gets built on. Um, we've been agitating for stablecoin legislation. <clears throat> we've been agitating for the ability for a stablecoin issuer to not have to be dependent on commercial bank risk, but to actually be able to hold uh, funds directly with the Fed and have the ability to use the Fed payment system. That's, I think, in some of the drafts that have floated around on, mm -hmm. on, on a payment stablecoin act in the U.S. So maybe start with stablecoin legislation and then we can talk about the kind of crypto asset, crypto markets uh, kind, of, yeah. kind of activity. I, I think it depends if we will be able to get something done piecemeal uh, because it, it's almost like there's a couple different camps. There's some folks that want a grand bargain. Let's just handle everything mm -hmm. all at once mm -hmm. and just get this done. And then there's folks that might want to look sector by sector, use case by UK, use case, and actually pick off the, mm -hmm. the lowest hanging fruit. I hope it's the latter. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly the direction that it looked like things were going with mm -hmm. McHenry Waters and, yep. and that bill, which I know is getting a little bit more pickup and, and, yes. and kind of coming back to the fore this year, which is good. Um, I hope that's the case. I'm not sure how to think about it um, and in, in terms of you know, handicapping the probabilities. But um, I certainly think that if you do get one bill passed, that would be a critical one. Mm -hmm. um, now, we have to see what happens the next couple of weeks because we're right in the middle of a banking crisis. Yeah. And if a bunch of regional banks start going down, you know, I think good stablecoin legislation and a public-private partnership becomes that much Huge. more important. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just naturally trending towards a CBDC. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, there's a solve for this, which is... Well, it, the U.S. It, is already the market leader. Yeah. Through, you know, is. no real help of the government. Yeah, right? it is. Um, it is. But, but because of these partnerships that, that you and, and some of the other issuers have, have you know, been able to strike, mm -hmm. um, it would be a, a fumble to give that up now. Yeah, yeah. Wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> um, the, the, the market side, obviously, it, it, it feels like, um, you know, the, 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 the various, f you know, failures of different firms has sort of um, g given rise to a lot of enforcement actions uh, and, and, and maybe a, a feeling that, you know, um, there's less political air cover for people who were trying to, you know, work towards, you know, bipartisan policy work, whether it's in the commodities side, the security side. Otherwise, uh, so we've, we've sort of seen that pivot from 
one could argue the, the administration, maybe you could also, yeah. you could say it's specific agencies, actors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we, we have that happening. Um, but we also are hearing, you know, from, you know, from congressional, uh, you know, leaders, like we got to do something about this. Yeah. And I don't think uh, people want to just sit back and, you know, quote unquote, let it burn or sit back and just say, this is just uh, an enforcement of existing laws question. It seems like yeah. that whether it be in the White House or in congressional leaders or others, there, there is a sense of like, we have to have kind of you know, regulation. And I, in fact, I, I think the US is, is driving and leading a, an FSB level dialogue mm -hmm. on you know, consistent, normalized crypto asset regulation in the G20. Yeah. Uh, which would, which you know, gets back to that regional issue as well. Which is like, is, is this a short-term arbitrage, or are we are we dealing with something more systemic uh, globally? I, I think in the U.S., I mean, I'm not as plugged in internationally on some of the policy efforts. Um, my focus is on the U.S. right now, just because I happen to think yeah. that that's going to be the primary battlefront for mm -hmm. crypto as an asset class. You know, if we want to maintain our lead in tech and financial services, crypto is going to have to be an important component of that that we get right. And I'm just not moving again, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm, you know, there's some folks. Yeah, I'll leave the country. I'm not moving my family. So, like, I'm 40 miles from the from the fight uh, in mm -hmm. in some direction. I'm not going yeah. to dox myself, but um, uh, I think it's important that we get it right at home uh, in the U.S. I'm saying at home from Paris, so, you know, with with Paris mm -hmm. in the background. But uh, I think it's important that we get it right. Um, in the U.S., and I think one of the most unfortunate things about the um, the timing uh, of, of how everything kind of blew up around FTX last year, um, I mean, Sam screwed everybody. Uh, you know, I don't think that we should really say his name. I'll make an exception just to kind of you know tell tell this story. But I don't think most people realize how close. DCCPA, this yep. bill Stabano Bozeman was, very, very and and I would argue how close it was to being actually a pretty good bill. Like yeah. there were some, and 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 people don't really appreciate yeah. like the legislative process or like how some of these things get crafted. Yeah. But some of the things that leaked that everybody was up in arms about, you know, first of all they were old versions. Second of all, like the problematic pieces were based on some technical misunderstandings. And we were maybe a few paragraphs yeah. of different sections away from having a pretty good. Yeah. Um, backbone for at least how are we going to regulate some of the institutional players. Um, and you can argue over whether that would have disproportionately benefited FTX. I think that would have been a problem based on you know, some, of, some of the ways that this was being interpreted. But um, if you just took them out of the equation and you just looked at this with like two brand new senators, yeah. two brand new congressmen that were introducing this bipartisan legislation, I think you would look at that today and you'd say, that's actually not a bad bill. Yeah, the totally. thing, The things that have to be ironed out a little bit are how do we define what these tokens are and how they should be regulated without breaking them? Yeah. And then who has jurisdiction over that? Yeah. You can kind of work out somewhat naturally, but can we just apply a little bit of common yeah. sense to it as well? Yeah. Right? And that's what's been missing in, in this entire process and all these conversations. Yeah. So I go back to 2018 uh, when uh, you know we owned and operated in an exchange um, that had actually been you know historically involved in a lot of the tokens that were uh, out in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but you know the SEC came out with guidance, uh, further guidance I should say about how to interpret the Howey test and the Howey yep. test prongs relative to a a crypto asset that was famously uh, in April of 2018. And I wrote a bunch about, about it then, and, and, and I felt very strongly that what they were putting forward was really problematic, and that the challenge is we don't have, uh, the, basically the challenge is that digital assets do not uh, neatly fit mm -hmm. into the financial instrument categories of currencies, commodities, and securities. They yep. don't. Some do, and many don't. And, and so a lot of regulators in other parts of the world have basically sort of said, okay, we acknowledge that there are these digital tokens that people issue and that are tied to a technology or some, some infrastructure, and we're gonna, we're gonna regulate you know, disclosure issues around mm -hmm. them 
and where, what markets they can be in and, and kind of have market supervision around that, which I, I think is closer to the Digital Commodities and Consumer Protection Act uh, in, in, in substance. But, you know, it, it, it still comes back to, like, we have to define digital assets and, and the types of digital assets in statutes, right? We cannot just look at look in the rearview mirror at the past of these instruments. These are these are novel instruments that that you know work across a spectrum. And I'd be yeah. interested if if you feel similarly. Like, don't we just need to bear down and do the hard work of defining, you know, these instruments and and, and not have the kind of square peg square hole uh, kind of uh, or whatever the right metaphor is kind of approach to these? I think. It, it's always that fuzzy gray area um, that holds up the works, right? Mm -hmm. With DCCPA, it was, well, we can't regulate the exchanges because how are we thinking about decentralized exchanges, mm -hmm. right? And there were different edge cases that would yeah. come up. And, and you know, the policymakers, you know, either the regulators that were pushing and kind of weighing in from, from their side on, on certain things or the, the folks that were actually holding pen and on the staff level, they're trying to come up with this theory of everything for... Mm -hmm. Assets that in some cases have been in existence for two or three years, yeah. right? So um, I think one of the problems is right now people are trying to come up with a theory of everything yeah. <laughs> for crypto regulation yeah. instead of just focusing on the low-hanging fruit that would get us 90% of the way there yeah. today and, and would probably take an afternoon to draft when you really kind of boil it down, right? Who has jurisdiction? What are the changes that this technology introduces? that are gonna make it complicated to fit in under the letter of like existing you know, law when it comes to how we regulate commodities or derivatives or securities. Make those tweaks, right? Specifically for, for these assets or this subset of assets that has these characteristics and then put everything else that's in the gray area yeah. in a safe harbor bucket, uh -huh. right? Um, not a green light to do whatever the hell you want, but some sensible you know, framework where okay, we're not gonna be able to grapple with every single edge case today because it's a rapidly evolving industry, but you know what we can do? We can at least go back to what the spirit of the law is and we can go back to like our mandates as regulators, what do we need to see to get comfort mm -hmm. in, in you know, these, uh, these assets being supported by you know, regulated infrastructure companies, for instance. Um, and Commissioner Peirce, you know, um, these, these institutions are not monoliths, but you know, yeah. Hester Peirce from the SEC, around that same time, proposed the, the 1.0 of harbor. the safe harbor, and, yeah. and she had a couple of different iterations. And we were intimately familiar with some of what went into that because yeah. a lot of it mirrored yeah. our early framework for dis, quote unquote disclosures for these different token projects. Yeah. And we've iterated on, on that as well. Um, that makes a lot of sense, not because it's good for us or it's good for the industry or you know, good for the regulators. That's true, but also if you take seriously, for instance, that the SEC's mandate is to protect investors, ensure fair and efficient markets, and promote capital formation. Mm -hmm. Today they're 0 for 3. A safe harbor gets them 3 for 3, mm -hmm. and it doesn't give anything away long term. Mm -hmm. By definition, you can craft a safe harbor so that it only applies to assets or different sectors that are beneath a certain you know, dollar value threshold, or whether that's trading or market cap or, or time in market if you want to you know, take the, take the years-based approach. Um, and we just haven't really seen any of that. Yeah, maybe changing gears a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I've had the benefit of meeting with a lot of regulators and in a lot of markets around the world. You know, one of the things that we're focused on is, you know, because USDC is so prevalent in digital asset markets, is working with regulators in the major markets so that they have a good understanding of USDC. And, and we're seeing a lot of, of markets sort of green light the use mm -hmm. of, of USDC by market participants. Um, but you know, it's 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 very interesting to see sort of the the kind of regulatory competition, mm -hmm. and it and really seems to be picking up. We're here in France, um, and you know, France is is making a big play to be the center of European uh, you know crypto asset market activity, and I, I think they're doing a very good job of that. They're they're leaning in more than any other major country in Europe yep. uh, right now, uh, and. You know, you're seeing United, United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, taking a, a very big step. Singapore, as you noted, et cetera. So, um, do you, I mean, 
What do you think the world looks like? Do you think there's a world where there's you know, a huge array of, of, of technology and, and infrastructure and, and, and utility and other things that's sort of available to everyone except for people in the United States? I mean, or, or yeah. you know, what, what, I mean, is it, is it are, are we facing that level of, of issue? Or do you think, or what do you think on that? Our margin is France's opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's silly to think that um, just because the U.S. has a dominant financial and, yeah. and tech infrastructure in certain areas, that that will always be the case. Yeah. There's we 800 don't have, million people in Europe. And, well, and we don't have to look far. 5G yeah. and telecom, everything that's going on with semiconductors. We just spent half a trillion dollars trying to re-onshore yeah. semiconductor manufacturing, and we're actively pushing people in different segments that are going to be strategically important off yeah. offshore. Yeah. Does anybody yeah. draw a straight line from the like two data the national, points? <laughs> the national economic interest and the national security interest in this for, for this industry in the U.S., needs to be more fully, I think, articulated because I, I, I agree. I mean, this is a... And you can do that covering stable coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of these other processing and blockchain you know, platforms without saying, you know what, we need all of this yeah. like Wild West access to right. any new novel, right. you know, diver derivative instrument right. that, right. you know, you can cover been trading for three 80 weeks. You can 90% of, of this. Yeah. More, I more, think, really. More, and, and, yeah. and, and I think... Again, that's what's missing if, and if you're a developer on the other side of that and you have a five-person team and you have a few hundred million dollars in total value yeah. locked in your you know, unaudited or barely audited smart yeah. contracts that right. have been getting hacked every other week, maybe right. it's time to look in the mirror and think maybe this is right. decentralization theater or we, shouldn't, right. we should have some, um, some speed bumps, some yeah. self-imposed kind of like governors More on these golf structures. carts, yeah. right? so that we can soft roll this. And that is only going to happen with better US policy and I think a little bit better US, uh, international coordination. Otherwise, the incentive is always gonna be mm -hmm. go as fast, as hard, and as big as you can, as yeah. quickly as possible to win the market, right? Yeah, so. Totally makes sense. Um, I, I wanna come back to uh, the final boss. Uh, and, and I know something that you've referenced uh, uh, in, in, in the past is sort of the the, obviously, the FDR executive order, which mm -hmm. uh, effectively uh, seized all gold in the United States. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, is there a risk, a, a genuine yes. risk? We have a, we have a, you know, a, a p potential for uh, a financial crisis. We have uh, loss of confidence in the banking sector. Uh, you know, we've actually seen a, a Bitcoin rally. If Bology's right, it'll be a million dollars in six months. I'm not so sure. But uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking. I, I, I we're, think that he hopes not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's know, sort of the, so, the, the, yeah. the yeah. As you've also commented, like you know, it's the it's the disorder uh, it's the disorder hedge. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, you know, it, it, you know, in a world where you have all these breakdowns and you see a, a kind of uh, uh, you know uh, exponential growth in a non-sovereign digital store value like Bitcoin. Um, will more governments, I'm not just talking about the U.S. government, will more governments just step in and, 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 and attempt uh, to control that? There's a few steps that you'd have to uh, go before that becomes realistic, but um, there's a joke within the crypto community. Well, not really a joke. I mean, it's legitimate, right? You, you can self-custody your coins, but yep. you're still susceptible to a $5 wrench attack, right? So it doesn't matter how exotic your, um, your security setup is, yeah. if you are responsible with, yeah. with custodying your own assets, you know, that is also gonna come with certain, you know, certain levels of risk. And um, from a political perspective, you know, if things went sideways enough and Mm -hmm. Certain leaders, whether it's in the U.S. or, or any other jurisdiction, were looking for scapegoats, mm -hmm. right? Um, whether it's blaming folks in crypto for a crisis or it is just trying to impose a wealth tax, mm -hmm. they're really not dissimilar. Mm -hmm. um, you would take the same steps, and that could be, you know, to basically do the equivalent of the five-dollar wrench attack, but it's you know, law enforcement coming to your home and saying right. you have unreported you know, uh, foreign bank accounts, right? Mm -hmm. We already have these laws in the books in the US, right? You have to report your foreign bank accounts um, on an annual basis above a certain threshold. Yep. It would be 
yeah. trivial for well, Congress that was in, to pass that was in some similar. Treasury guidance uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I think, on, on crypto itself. You had to replace well, that, but that I believe that was for the the ex international exchanges. Oh, that was right. That's right. It's Not that, but it, my point is, um, it would be trivial to yeah. sneak one line sure. amendment into some must-pass bill. Right. Basically, applying that to self-custody. Yeah. Um, and and you know any any wallets that an individual has. So right there, you know you can technically trip people up in terms of non-compliance. So there's there's a number of things. Um, again, not to get too dystopian, but there there are these tools that everybody knows exist um, and that we you know have to prep for and, and make sure you know it never gets to that point. Um, but uh, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that that is you know, totally mm -hmm. totally off the table right now. And historically, we've thought about that in the context of China. Or, right. you know, other right. authoritarian regimes. But right. if you look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks with the way that Silvergate, you know, was yeah. was ultimately um, forced to its knees, with the way that the SVB conversations went to backstop those depositors, even though you know crypto had very little to yeah. do with it, yeah. you know, I, I tweeted something that four different headlines uh, from SVB, yeah. basically putting like crypto and SVB in the same headlines. Yeah almost as if it was part of like a talking points memo that was top down. Um, and then of course signature and that kind of, you know, uh, what, what, what's been, you know, I think going to get investigated at this point as to Don't whether bank that with targeted. a company that starts with an S. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so circle does not start with an S. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, that is, uh, it's, a, it's a concerning trend. Uh, I like the way that you guys have put it though, which is, you know, something I agree with. Crypto has to be protected from the banks at this point. Yeah, and if they only let you know fully reserved banks, you know, yeah. actually legally register, we are we are then, working on that. You know, we would we would we would have uh, we wouldn't have these issues because the crypto companies actually would like to have full yeah. reserves and sound money audits, principles through and, and sound through. money principles. Yeah, um, but of course, you know, we know. Uh, we know why you know, certain folks don't want that because it, it, it would be, I think, highly disruptive to the financial system. So there's a lot of different concerns. I'm not too, I'm not in Bology's camp yet. Um, I'm closer to him than I think the mainstream, uh, most likely in terms of how, how I think some of this could go. Um, but you know, maybe it's blind optimism or the mm -hmm. fact that I just have no intention of moving my family. Yeah. Uh, that you know, yeah. keeps me a little bit more cheery about how this is gonna resolve. Yeah, I, I you know, um and I also feel like we're going to play a role in this, too. Yes, I don't feel are. like a non-participating yes, character yeah, right per, now. So per, Personhood and presence yeah. is, is real and, and, and material. We've certainly felt that. And as you know, from day one, we had the, you know, we're going to walk in through the front door. We're mm -hmm. going to engage with policymakers and regulators everywhere we go and be as transparent about what we're doing as possible. And that has served us well. Um, and I think we'll, during this pivotal time, continue to serve us well. I, you know, I, as I kind of step back, I mean, I'd sort of draw on the lessons of the, of the commercialization of the internet in its first generation and second generation. And, you know, there's a thing that happened, which is that the technology got to a point where the, the utility really took off. And, and, and oftentimes that happened before there were a lot of regulations around it. And, um, and, and when that happened, you know, people and, 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 and corporations and firms um, you know, were sort of like, this is incredible. I, like, this is solving yeah. problems at scale for me that I haven't been able to be solved. And at that point, it was, it was too expensive politically mm -hmm. to, to, to put the genie back in the bottle. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the things I ad admire about this industry is, you know, there is a relentless pursuit of you know, improving this technology so that we can get to a point where a user can, you know, uh, self-custody a digital wallet with social recovery and not have to acquire Ethereum to make a payment and can just have uh, the use of, of something like USDC as a transactional medium. And, and that, that's the kind of thing that can light up like WhatsApp-like scale. Mm -hmm. And like, that's on the horizon in the next six to 12 months. And yep. The regulatory stuff is not going to get resolved in the next six to 12 months. And so I think there is a genuine potential that over the next couple of years, you're going to sort of see this, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of utility curve start to really kick in. And, uh, and, and, and I think there are, you know, frictionless, borderless, global, you know, uh, smart contract mediated money and, uh, you know, is is not something people are going to want to put back in the bottle. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I, I'm optimistic, as you know, uh, I, I sort of manage through optimism, uh, even in the face of extraordinarily difficult uh, situations. And I'm optimistic about that, that transformation. I'd be curious about you. I think we need to get better at storytelling. And, and part of it is we need to be better pulling accurate versions of history, not just the tweet length versions of history, right? So you, you made the, the point about the 90s. Section 230 mm -hmm. barely uh, was incorporated into the kind of early internet regulations. Yeah. Um, former senator at the time, Joe Biden, was a big fan of the chipper clip. This yeah, is you know, probably remember. something you were in, intimately familiar with, right? Like the, 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 the backdoor encryption. Whether there was going to be encryption allowed on the open internet yeah. was not a foregone conclusion. No, it was razor thin and yeah. it almost went the other direction, yeah. if not for you know, a couple of, of public you know, PR campaigns yeah. um, that were ultimately effective. So um, first of all, that, that version of history did not necessarily need to play totally. out the, the way yeah. that it ended up playing out. Totally. So to, to the point that I just made about not being a non-participating character, I think you know, th this, this, this is an important yeah. kind of period of time. Um, we also have to avoid own goals, and you know, that kind of ties you know, to the, you know, tell the right stories, but also stop telling the yeah. shitty stories yeah. that uh, kind of trip everybody up and, and, and make everyone look guilty by association. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's gonna, I think that's gonna take a little bit more coordination than a decentralized kind of ragtag group of, of entrepreneurs is used to. Um, but, it, you know, frankly, it's gonna have to happen soon, or I think we'll be on the wrong side of that 230 and chipper clip conversation when it comes to crypto, yeah. at least in the US. It is a pivotal moment, no doubt. Um, Ryan, great pleasure to have you on, uh, on the show. Really enjoyed the conversation. Always a pleasure, thanks.